Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Tanya class, Tanya and You, Chapter 24. We are making good headway through the ideas of the Tanya, Chapter 24, another home run, as you could say, if, I, you know, if it even makes sense for me to say about a chapter of the Tanya. What a inspirational Tanya chapter, and... A, uh, I like to use the word paradigm shift. There are certain ideas that we just have um, growing up, our worldview, and the Tanya comes and just hits it on its head and say and says, you got to have a paradigm shift. You just got to change the way you see things. A total, total, total um, shift in perspective. And that is... Uh, chapter 24, and it's interestingly because a lot of these ideas are like parenthetically, like by the way he throws in this like bombshell of like, wow as a side note we come out with this like totally new view on the, on certain ideas, so in chapter 24 we'll come out with this new idea, a new understanding of what it means, the inner struggle behind the sin what goes on in the psyche of a Jew when they are debating with themselves? Yes or no? Yes or no? Do I give in to my uh, to my instincts? Do I give in to my weaknesses? Do I give in to my urges? Or do I stand strong because they know it's right? What goes through the mind? And it kind of it, it, it uncovers this beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, connection that we have with God even while we sin. At the same time, some of the mistakes, the uh, mistakes in judgment that we may make while we sin. And this is all in part of this larger idea that the Tanya is developing over here over the last several chapters, beginning with chapter 18, where he begins this idea where each and every one of us has what we call a hidden love, which means like this intrinsic connection bond with god that isn't always revealed it isn't always front and center in fact for many it may be deeply deeply hidden buried under many many layers of concealment and when it comes to our uh, daily decisions that's not part of the menu. It's not something that we uh, even uh, we even consider. However, it's still there. How do we know it's still there? Because when it comes to the crises, when it comes to the big decisions, decisions of our Jewish identity, decisions of what we all believe in, we believe in one God, we don't uh, serve idols. These are big no-nos. These are big uh, f fundamentals. In Judaism, there, we're willing to even die for it sometimes. Say, so, you know what? It's my Judaism comes before anything else. Although, in the small decisions, perhaps it's not so apparent. And the Tanya kind of develops over the last few chapters, what exactly is this belief in God that we are willing to die for? What is it? And we explain this idea that one believing in one God is not only believing in one God and not two gods, but believing that all is God. The oneness of the world is that it's all really an extension of God. And every area in, in life is ultimately an extension of God. It, it, it receives its vitality from God. And therefore, to say that there's a space, there's a decision, there's an area in life where it's void of God. This isn't God. This is an other. That ultimately is idolatry. Because idolatry isn't only serving an idol. Idolatry is a theology. It's a theology that there is a space where there isn't God. And that one little decision that we make, where that decision is basically saying that there's me and then there's God. That is idolatrous. So we spoke about this in great length in the previous chapters where we focused on the positive, right? What happens when we do a mitzvah? That when we do a mitzvah, 
we our soul is connected with the oneness of God. We're able to access the oneness of God, the mitzvah, which is the innermost will of God, where God is revealed. That is when we do a mitzvah, and when we do a small little good deed, we put a little penny in charity, when we light the Shabbat candles, when we call a friend and we, we visit a neighbor, the small little acts of goodness and kindness, the small little acts of mitzvahs between us and God or between us and another human, that is the area, that's the space where godliness is totally revealed and we are able to basically uh, live up to that idea where every area of life is really infused with godliness. Chapter 24 talks about the opposite. Talks about the negative. What happens when we do a sin, right? When we do a mitzvah, we know we connect with the oneness of God. What happens when we sin? You know what? I don't, this, you know, the terminology sin doesn't sit well with me because who wants to talk about sin? Let's, let's talk about the positive. Let's talk about it when we do a mitzvah. But the truth is we have to talk about sin. And especially with this perspective, it gives us a really positive perspective on what it means <laughs> when a Jew sins, which is amazing. So what does it mean, a sin? A sin basically means when we when we do something, when we don't follow in the ways of God. God gives us instructions, and we don't follow it. That's a sin. Now, are there levels? Are there different types of sins? In other words, like this. I'm a parent. Many of you are parents. A parent gives instructions to two children. One of them, they say, um, watch your younger sibling. Make sure your younger sibling doesn't run into the streets. Okay. It's a pretty important uh, chore, important instruction. For the other uh, uh, child, the parent says, um, Watch the oven. Make sure our our, our uh, you know French fries in the oven doesn't 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 uh, overcook doesn't overbake doesn't get burnt. Okay, two instructions. Is one more important than the other? Is is it more important for one child to listen than the other child to listen? Obviously, you'll say. A child running into the street is a lot more dangerous. But there is something, there's a common denominator between the two. That at the moment, they both have this obligation to listen to their parents equally. Because this is the parent's will. Take an take example, a king. A king calls in two ministers. He calls the minister of janitorial charge of all the, all the janitors and says, listen, minister, I've been walking around the palace. I see that the garbage cans are filling up too fast. We got to do something about this. What I want you to do is instead of emptying the garbage cans once a day, you got to empty them twice a day. And that's an order. Okay. And then the king calls in the minister of defense. Say, listen, there's a war brooding. And I need to brewing, and I need, I need, I need you to get to, to to mobilize the country to save our kingdom because we got to fight the enemy. Okay, two instructions from the king, and now the next day, the king calls in these two ministers. Says, "No, have you followed my orders?" They say, "I'm sorry, king, we have not followed your orders." Which one has committed a greater sin? So, of course, after the fact, you know, there's 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 a lot more uh, weight carried on the one that has much more of a, an important role. But there is a common denominator, the fact that we were, that the person did not listen to God's will, to the king's will. And the same is true with us and God. There are many, many commandments, many ways in God, that, that God wants us to follow. And some of them perhaps seem to be more important, some are less important. But the common denominator is that there is the will of God, and I need to follow the will of God. 
after the fact, maybe I can start looking at it and say, you know, this is more important, less important. But at, at, at the moment, when I am giving this commandment, I have one thing to do. Follow the will of God, no matter what it is. No matter what it is. And when I follow the will of God, I am connected to the one to God and, and, and to the oneness of God, to, re, to, the, to the revealed, pure, raw energy of God. And when I don't, I am separated from God. And who wants to be separated from God? Who wants to put themselves in a space where there is where it's godless? At least in a re, in a revealed man. When I am announcing that there is a space where I fill this space and God does not fill this space. That's what happens when we do when we do a sin. We are announcing, we are uh, expressing this feeling within us that I take precedence over God. That's idolatry. In the words of Tanya. Now, you may ask, well, why would I, why would anyone ever want to do that? Why would any sane person ever want to separate themselves from the source of life, from God himself? How foolish can you be? And the truth is, the Tanya says, we are being foolish. And he quotes a a, uh, a verse in uh, in the Torah, actually from just a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, we, we read this in the Torah, where we use the word shtut, which means a foolishness, a folly. Oh, here. You hear me? You able to hear me? Okay, I'm getting some uh, errors over here. I'm sorry about that. So, there is a an illusional spirit that comes across the person. And this illusional spirit convinces the person you can do this in. It's not the end of the world. In other words, like this, what the Tanya is saying, is that sinning for a Jew is unnatural. It's a virus. Naturally, a Jew should not want to sin. Like we said, it's idolatrous. It's the theology of idolatry. We should not want to sin. It's unnatural. And the fact that a person is willing to sin is because we have this illusional Spirit that comes across us, that comes over us. And I'll break it down into three points. But just an, uh, an, uh, an amazing idea, a paradigm shift. Sometimes we think that naturally we will want to sin. What do you mean sin? Naturally, I want to follow my evil inclination. Naturally, I want to follow what feels good, right? Being selfish is natural. Children are born to be selfish. Thinking about self. What do I want? How could I gain from this? What's more pleasurable for me? What is more gratifying for me? That's the way we're, that's the makeup of the person, seemingly. So naturally, I would want to do what feels good at the moment. And then I would tell you, but we should have the mind, control the heart, and do something unnatural and you know, control yourself. That's the way seemingly we, we view things. And Tanya says, no, that's that's a terrible way of looking at things. Naturally, naturally, we are connected to God. Who wants to be separated from God? Our soul is crying out, connect with God, do the right thing. That's our nature. That's the beauty of, of, of our nature. It's pure. It's connected to God. To sin, that's unnatural. That is doing something unnatural. And that's because we have this illusion. That we are still connected with God. The subconscious feeling within us that we are connected to God, but the conscious feeling tells us it's okay. But this conscious feeling is not the real you. It's not me talking. It's a spirit within me talking, convincing me to do this sin. And how is it done? To justification. We justify it. We say, it's only a small sin. 
right? It's taking out the garbage. It's all it is. It's not dealing with wars. It's not dealing with the big decisions. I'm still connected with God. I'm still connected. It's a small sin. How important could it be? That's what we tell ourselves. We justify it. The justification is the illusional spirit that the Tanya talks about. If we would know that with every sin, even the smallest sin, I have a little inner struggle. Do I wake up in the morning and do my morning prayer or do I sleep in and skip it today? Do I study a little Torah as I, as I, as I committed to every day or do I say, you know what, I'm so busy, I have so many things going on in my life, let me skip it today. Do I get angry at my spouse because that's what's really, really boiling within me? Or do I control myself and say, you know what? Let me bite my tongue. Do what's right. It feels good at the moment to burst out in anger, but that's not what's right. All these little decisions, the little decision, let's zoom out to the big picture, right? I'm still a good person. I'm still connected with God. I do so many big mitzvahs. I'm a, God loves me, so I made a little mistake. And therefore, not looking backward, at the moment, I, I justify it. At the moment, they say, I can go ahead with it. I'm still a good person. That justification, the justification which tells us that even at the moment of sin, I am still connected with God, that is an illusion. Because at the moment, we do separate ourselves from God. And who wants to be separated from God even for a moment? And then the third point to make, so the point number one is that naturally the real me does not want to sin. Point number two is that how, does, how do I go about sinning? Because I am convincing myself that there's a justification over here. It's only something small. I'm not really disconnecting myself from my source of life from God. And the third point he makes is that sometimes we feel like, but I can't. I don't have the ability to overcome this challenge. It's so enticing. I'm so weak. The time says, no, you're not weak. You're strong. Come from a standpoint of, of, of a, from, from a place of strength. You have the ability to overcome it. You know why? Because it's not you. You truly don't want to do this. God believes in you. We wake up every morning and we say, Moda'ani. Moda'ani lefanecha. I thank you, God for returning my soul within me, and we conclude the prayer with the words, Rabba emuna secha, which means your faithfulness is great. Whose faithfulness? What faithfulness? Who's, faith in who? So one of the explanations that I heard is that we're saying that God's faith within us, God believes in each and every one of us. It's like a child going to school. And they're telling the parents, I don't know, I can't do it. I have a difficult test. I have, you know, social anxiety with my class. There's, I, I, I can't, I don't know how I'm going to get to the day. What does the parents say? Yingale, Maydale, you could do it. You'll, you'll, you'll do well. Just trust in yourself. Believe in yourself. Rabba Munasecha, God believes in us. We wake up in the morning, starting a new day. There's so much to deal with today. There's so many challenges. The world out there is, is, is making us meshuga. How am I going to withstand all the tests and struggles and tribulations? And God says, I believe in you. You have the ability to do it. You know why? Because I don't have to infuse you with extra strength. This is who you are. It's the real you. Just to tap into yourself, your true self. You'll see you have the ability to overcome it. But the spirit of folly, the spirit of illusion tells us we don't have the ability to overcome. And it's only a small little problem. It's only a small little uh, uh, disconnect, uh, you know, issue. It's not really disconnecting ourselves from God. These are all illusional. I, I Just yesterday, I was listening to a podcast. I like to listen to podcasts, especially when, I, when we drive. I was driving back. From Atlanta, I did my nephew's bris in Atlanta. We're driving back with Hamushka and the kids. She put on the podcast. It was a guy, David Schottenstein. A wonderful, wonderful fellow. I don't know him personally, but uh, just telling his life story, 
how he ended up behind bars. Yeah, he ended up in prison for a year because of financial, you know, being a little bit uh, playing 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 the game a little bit with the government. He ended up behind bars. So he what he was saying is that how does this all this start? Justification. He actually used the word from Tanya Ruachstos. We convince ourselves it's a great area. We convince ourselves it's just a small little thing. The small thing. What's going to happen already? Small thing. And we do a little once. And we do it twice. And that, right? We're still good people. We're giving a lot of charity. We're living good lives. We have good, nice families. We're being nice to people. We're not cheating any person. We're just cheating the government. The government has the money. Blah, blah, blah. All these justifications that we, we tell ourselves. But ultimately, we know deep down this isn't right. This isn't right. And that justification is the ruach, this illusional spirit. But what the time is arguing, importantly, is it's the ruach, it's not the person themselves. They themselves, the person themselves, deep down knows and recognizes, I don't want to be connect, disconnected from God, even for a moment. However, we convince ourselves it's okay. It's okay. But the truth is, it's not okay. Because while we commit this sin, whether it's a big sin or a small sin, it's all the same. At that moment, at that moment, we are disconnecting ourselves from God. And so much so that Tanya says, think about this. We have free choice. We have free choice. At that moment when we are making this choice, we, in a way, are worse off. We are more. We are further from God than all other creatures of the world. Because all other creatures of the world don't have free choice. So whatever they're doing is exactly what God wants them to do. You go to the, if you go to the African safari and you're watching these hyenas chew up a uh, whatever uh, uh, another animal. That's exactly what what God wants them to do, because they don't have free choice. This is their nature, and they're following their nature. They don't have the ability to do anything else. But we do have free choice, and when we make that choice to disconnect ourselves from God, not only are we disconnected from God for that at that moment, but we are worse off than everything else. So think about this, Tanya says. Think about what happens the moment we make this choice. We are, we, we are saying that there is God and there's me. There's another power. There's another deity almost besides from God. That's idolatry. So the same way when we do a mitzvah, we are connecting with the oneness of God. When we do a sin, we do the opposite of the mitzvah. We are separating ourselves. We are disconnecting from the one of God. However, this is only at the moment while we are doing the mitzvah, the, the, the sin. A moment later, once we have already committed the sin, now we are still connected with God. There are few sins which we refer to them as the detrimental sins. Sins that when they are committed, the Torah says we receive kares, which is like total disconnect, discommunication, disconnection from, disconnected, disconnected from God. But for the most part, when we do a sin, after the sin was committed, we have uh, slightly damaged our connection. Of course, there's always the ability of teshuva, of repentance. And we're obviously still very much connected to God. But at that moment, during those few seconds of gratification, is it worth it? Because in those few moments of while we commit a sin, we are disconnected from God. And then the Tanya concludes with something very powerful. That ultimately, you know, Tanya always has to always has to see the positive side of things. And like I said, we don't we don't talk a lot about sin. Who wants to talk about sin? Let's talk about the positive. Who wants to talk about the negative? However, we need that perspective. So we have to realize that doing a sin is very harsh. It's severe. 
it's disconnecting ourselves from God for that moment. Yes, the moment later, we are reconnected with God. We got we, we, got, we, got, we got a little damage in our connection. It's a little uh, iffy. It's a little, uh, you know, sh a little shaky connection. We got to get a better uh, Wi-Fi. However, it's still there. We got we to, we you know, do some teshuva, tie some knots to reconnect it. However, the Tani concludes another powerful idea that even while we do the sin, we still have the godly connection. We are disconnecting ourselves at the same moment that we are deeply connected with God. Because ultimately, we still have a godly soul. And the godly soul is not going anywhere. But you know what's happening to it? We are schlepping it into the garbage. We are schlepping it into exile. We are taking it from a high roof, throwing it down to a deep pit. It's being tortured. At the moment of the sin, our godly soul is still there. We don't get rid of it. It's just so deeply pained. That's what the time it concludes. This ruach shtus, this folly, this illusion that we that, that goes through our mind is overcomes us, takes us over, but doesn't change our identity. Our godly soul is still there. And sometimes it's revealed. Sometimes, even while we are seemingly committing a sin, our godly soul is knocking on the door and saying, hello, remember, I'm still here. In Ukraine, there is this famous man by the name of Vladimir Zelensky. I'm sure you ever heard his name, right? The Prime Minister, President, whatever they call him, of Ukraine. A Jewish guy, Jewish man. Unfortunately, not very proud of his Jewish heritage. And uh, not, not, you know, very far from, very far from practicing Jew. But uh, Jew nonetheless it has that Jewish identity, right? Can't take it away from you. It's who you are. You're born with it. A number of years ago, this is before he became as a prime minister, that what it is, of, of Ukraine. But he was already involved in politics. He was at an event where many uh, of the shakers and movers of Ukraine were there, including a Chabad rabbi. Somehow the Chabad rabbi made it in to, 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 this, to this event. And the Chabad, the Chabad rabbi was seated actually right near Mr. Zelensky. And there were many other prominent uh, Ukrainian politicians. And what does the Chabad rabbi do? Of course, you know, they, strike, they started a conversation with Mr. Zelensky. And during the conversation, he does what Chabad rabbis do best. Mr. Zelensky, would you like to put on tefillin? You can imagine that. The last thing he was thinking about was tefillin. We're not sure if he ever put on tefillin in his life. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Not at this moment, it's not what he was thinking about. Now is not the good time to put on the film. And he actually got somewhat um, annoyed and frustrated with this rabbi. Oh, crazy rabbi. What you? And he like said, no, not interested yet. And he got up and walked away. There was another um, Ukrainian politician who noticed this interaction. Did not, did not know exactly what the rabbi asked him, but he noticed that he got annoyed at him. So he goes over to Mr. Zelensky and says, tell me, what did that jid want from you? And use the word jid in a derogatory manner. What did that Jew want? You know what Zelensky said? You're calling him a jid. He walked right back to the rabbi and says, rabbi, let's put on the phone. While a person is what seemingly is doing, committing a sin. What's a sin? Meaning, so don't offer you to do a mitzvah putting on the film. There's an obligation for every Jewish male to put on the film every day. And we're not putting on the film. Seemingly, I deny the request. I'm disconnecting myself from God. But it doesn't mean that we don't have a, a godly soul within us. At that moment. And it needs some, you know, a little shtech, a little something from the outside to reveal it. And we, and we go back to put on the film. So this is kind of the, like the economy, like the, the the two extremes within the chapter twenty four. On the one hand, we're saying the 
the severity of, of, of a sin, that we are disconnecting ourselves from God. Every small little sin, it's not just the big idolatrous sins. Ooh, I went to I went to a, to a, to a house of worship and I bowed out to idols. Oh, what a terrible sin. Yeah, of course it's a terrible sin. But we're not talking about that. The big sins, the small little sins, the small little decisions that we make in our lives that a question between self and God. Who is going to win the battle? Selfless, selfish, right? That's the question. These small little sins is the same as the big sins. Ultimately, it's announcing that there is me and there's God. There is God and there is an other. That's the theology of idolatry. That's what the Tanya says. Every little decision is disconnecting ourselves from God at the moment. That's the severity of the sin. Think about that. Don't let this illusional spirit convince you. Every moment, this is what we should be thinking about with, with, with every decision. At the same time, second half of the time, he says, but doesn't mean that we're fully disconnected from God. After the sin, we're, we are connected with God once again. And even during the sin, we still have our godly soul, which is in exile and pain, but nevertheless still very much in existence. This is who we are. This is our connection. So this is a little overview of chapter 24, kind of continuing on this theme to understand what it means that a Jewish person is willing to die for the big cardinal sins and, the, and the, you know, the big mitzvahs, but the, not, not for the small ones, which is a mistake because the small mitzvahs, the small avarice are sitting the same theology behind it, whether it is a big, you know, decision or a small decision, ultimately it's a decision between me and God, and that is the same, the big ones and the small ones. And that is what we should be thinking about at every moment of the day. Do I want to connect with God at this moment? Or do I want to be disconnected from God at this moment? And this will help us with, with all these decisions that we have to make. This kind of wraps up the, the development of this idea of starting in chapter 18. And in chapter 25, next week, we'll kind of wrap it all up. How this has to do with, the, you know, go, going back to the idea of this hidden love and how this comes into fruition in a practical sense. We'll see that in the next chapter. But I'll leave you with this. Thank you for joining us this beautiful Thursday morning. And I uh, wish you a good Shabbos. And looking forward to seeing you next week. I know that Lynn had a question. Give me one second. Um, yes, good point, Lynn. I always feel I am connected to God because we are human. It does not make my actions acceptable and creates the urge for me to improve better with God's help. Yes, absolutely. Listen, we're not being judgmental over here. It's, this is something very personal. We should all look at ourselves and say, how can I become a better person knowing this? Listen, the tiny was written for the average person, right? We know we're not perfect. We all know, like we, we're using the word sin, and sometimes it has like a negative connotation, like, oh, sinning. But like I said, use the word connecting with God, disconnecting with God every moment to improve ourselves, better, better, uh, you know, make, making better decisions every day. And this is the struggle of life. This is the struggle of life, but it kind of gives us some tools and some uh, ideas of, of, of how to think it through as we make these decisions.